distance that divides the Greeks and the Turks, creating an island stranded in time. In July 1989, I found myself flying from an airport in Turkish-occupied northern Cyprus to an airport in Turkey, and thence to Heathrow Airport in London, and then back to Cyprus, this time landing at a Greek airport in the south. I managed this incongruous journey in 24 hours, not in order to win a bet at the Travellers Club, but rather to show what partition does to a country and a people. An island smaller than Sicily or Sardinia has been utterly divided. In an exhausting day, when I'd flown 4,000 miles, I had covered a political distance of 100 Cypriot yards. One airport I could not have used is the island's international airport, closed when the Turks invaded in 1974. It's now an empty postmodern shell. Its facilities still preserved for the Cypriots of both communities who can no longer use them. The airport, like the frontier, is still caught in a frozen moment of 1974. Ever since the Turkish paratroopers fell from the sky in July of that year and cut Cyprus in two, this has been an island stranded in time. Turkey's invasion, a catastrophe on an epic scale for the Greek Cypriot majority, was greeted by many of the Turkish minority as a deliverance. An extremist coup, sponsored by the then military dictatorship in Greece, had given Turkey a long-awaited pretext for intervention. The Turkish action led to the occupation of one third of the territory of Cyprus, the proclamation of a separate Turkish Cypriot state and the displacement of nearly 200,000 Greek refugees. Even 15 years afterwards, images like this are still violently impressed on the Greek Cypriot memory. The fighting brought two members of the NATO alliance to the verge of open war. On this, the third largest island in the Mediterranean, there is a permanent confrontation, not just between two communities, but between their two motherlands, Turkey and Greece, both of whom have in the past tried to annex it. The smaller country, Greece, is the furthest away, but it has the sympathy of the largest number of Cypriots. Today, the line runs exactly as it was drawn 15 years ago when the guns fell silent. It runs through houses and streets and the middle of the capital, Nicosia. The dead zone is patrolled only by the United Nations, whose friendly, patient soldiers shuttle between two antagonistic armies, both of them members of NATO, both at daggers drawn. On the silent outskirts of the city, on a day so hot that he was the only one moving, I found Captain Bob Smallwood, a level-headed Canadian very far from home, arbitrating a nasty dispute about the aggressive piling of sandbags. Thank you. Our captain is very angry for a matter of, from, of the Turkish forces and uh, he wants to have the sword with you. I have spoken with the, uh, the operations officer of the Turkish forces battalion that's in that area and I have requested uh, an explanation.
our captain said if the sandbags don't leave from there, we put the double with the put over there. I understand. I understand that the captain will have pressure to uh, respond, and that's why I wish him to give me the time to solve the problem and have the sandbags removed, and then we will maintain the status quo without escalating tensions in the area. Captain Smallwood leaves the Greek side, hoping that his diplomatic efforts will keep a lid on the situation before he drives all of 50 meters to give identical reassurances to the Turkish side. It might seem trivial to an outsider, but in these conditions and to these men, an encroachment by even one sandbag into the neutral zone is a provocation. Here, the frozen line of the frontier even runs through the negotiating table. Both parties adhere very strictly to this absurd protocol for which real men have died. And we would like to inform you on this matter, see what you could do. Captain Smallwood, I understand that uh, you're doing the best as you can, but uh, I, I have to point this out that uh, this incident, these incidents, uh, hasn't just happened just once. Uh, it's been happening quite a few times. Since uh, they're doing this, it makes my job hard, and uh, of course, it's making your job hard as well. Please rest assured that I will be pursuing the matter with them further, and uh, thank you very much for coming today to Charlie 4-5 and uh, meeting with me. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie 4-5 is just one of hundreds of observation posts marking the Thanks fortified line of separation between Greeks and Turks. Bye-bye. See you later. From the air, Nicosia still looks like a single city, with its historic center enclosed by Venetian walls. But at ground zero, it is split down the center. Two cities, two systems, two mayors. Uh, but it goes zigzag. The Greek mayor is Lelos Demetriadis. If I wanted to telephone a friend on the other side, what would I have to do? Well, you can't do it. I once tried to do that, uh, to ring up uh, Mr. Akinji on the other side. There is a line, of course. I was told to wait. And then after a few minutes, uh, not a few minutes, about 10 minutes, uh, Kinji appeared at the other end. But I'm sure that in the meantime, about 10 other people put on the recordings. And that's not only Cypriots, by the way, <laughs> listening to what was, was going on. It's not a very nice way to do it. And you that. could only talk because you were officials? I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, if you were an ordinary Cypriot, no, you no. had a Turkish friend on no, the no, other no. side, you can't ring. No. And uh, more than that, of course, it's the psychological repercussion. I mean, it's over there, and you cannot even say good morning to them. The buffer zone also segregates Muslim from Greek Orthodox. The church of the island's tiny Catholic community sits right on the line of division, its northern door opening onto the Turkish side and its southern entrance giving onto the Greek sector. This, rather than any religious atmosphere, makes it necessary to talk in a whisper. This is our main door to the residence, which is well back into the Turkish side, you might say. And so, of course, we have, we have the Turkish soldier uh, right here, that if you, if you look out there, and uh, there, there he is. He's very, so there is. Yes, he's very sensitive uh, about uh, the uh, situation. Tell me why it's uh, kept shot. We, we had a, a sad experience of one young lady who came through this door and went out the other way and didn't return. And so because they, uh, they thought that we were helping someone to leave the north, as they would say, illegally, uh, then they said no one could go through, so that made it very difficult. No separation can be entirely complete, and certain people are still allowed to behave as if Cyprus was still one country. At the Lydra Palace Hotel, once the envy of the Levant, but now garrison HQ for the United Nations, and the only checkpoint on the frontier, diplomats and journalists may cross, subject to highly codified restrictions, as long as they're not Cypriots. And you can see the odd example of the triumph of expediency. Petrol may cross, but the drivers of the tanker must change. And certain foreign residents also enjoy the privilege, although it does involve them in keeping two sets of everything. Tourists are grudgingly permitted to cross, but only from the south to the north, and only for one day. 
Cypriots must keep in touch by remote control and at second hand. In Greek Nicosia's thriving commercial district, I found an old cross-border friendship while I was in search of a new suit. I also need a tailor who can make me look as if I'm a stone or too lighter. Yes. Can you recommend a good tailor? Are you going to make it to this side or the other side? Well, I'll go anywhere if I can find a good tailor. Yes. Now, I've been told you have a friend called Mr. Osman. Is that right? Yes, in the other side, yes. How yes, do you he's know him? a good tailor, and uh, I know him a long time ago and before the invention. At the checkpoint is a reminder of the deep bitterness felt by Greek Cypriots about the land and heritage that have been lost to them. A loss that is emotional as well as material. Still in pursuit of my suit, I made the trip that Mr. Prastitis and his countrymen can no longer make. Completed the formalities, crossed the frontier, and called on his old but now inaccessible friend, Mr. Osman. Well, I'm looking for Mr. Osman. It's me. You're Mr. Osman. Yes. Hello, how do you do? Nice well, my name is Christopher Hitchens, and I'm bringing you a bag. You might recognize the name. He's a friend of mine. Friend of yes. yours. He, that's what he says, Mr. Yeah. Prestitius. And he's he? given, well, he's very well, and he sends you warm greetings. Two-piece suit or three-piece suit? Well, he's given me enough for some spare trousers. So I'll have your measurements. So how long since you've seen Mr. Prestitius? Uh, since uh, 74, I haven't seen him. That's too long. Yes. Do you, can you send each other letters or messages? Oh, yes. We have the UN with us. We can send letters, we can send our wishes. Do you get a lot of customers from Mr. Prestida? Oh, yes. I suppose not many of them are separates. They are all UN, actually. Do you miss your friends on the other side? Of course. We are all friends. And you speak English very well. I speak English, I speak Greek. The Turks can speak good Greek, but Greeks, not much Turk, no much Turk. Yes. And you send Mr. Prestigious customers? I send them customers, he sent them customers, or it's his commission. It's business. Yes. Now, Mr. Osman, I've got a crucial question to ask you. Can I pay you in Cyprus money? Cyprus pounds or UK check also I will do. Excellent. International business. Yes. <laughs> in fact, the only legal currency here is Turkish mainland lira. Everything on the northern side of the line is now Turkish. Some of it dates from the medieval Ottoman Turkish Empire that once controlled the island. But some of it, like the soldiery, is from today's mainland neighbor. Recently, the Turkish prime minister described the north of Cyprus as a province of his country. Choose whatever street you may for a stroll, the wall is inescapable. On both sides of the wall, soldiers keep watch on each other as they have hour by hour for 15 years. Cyprus was a British colony until 1960, and there are unexpected ways in which this still shows as I found when on the Greek side I met Andrew, who'd been conscripted into the Cyprus National Guard while overstaying a holiday from his home in North London. See, what happened to me was I come over here last summer for holiday, and the law is if you stay over three months, you've got to join, you've got to join the army. And I didn't know, and I stayed over six months. And when I went to leave, they wouldn't give us a visa to leave. So I had to do the national service. His parents, both Cypriot born, had emigrated to London and then retired to Cyprus. This gave him a different perspective on Greek-Turkish relations. And in London, there are a lot of Turkish Cypriots, aren't there? Yeah, there is. Do you get on with them? Yeah, it's like, they're brought up different over there. Like, these lot are brought up not to communicate with Turkish people. But over there, we go to school with them, we go work with them, go drinking with them. Well, I personally have never met any Turkish Cypriot. Even though my father, my parents, they knew many. Nikos, a refugee from the town of Morfu, 
was a child at the time of the invasion. I remember the planes which were flying over Morphe, and uh, we saw also parachute chambers. Uh, we were hiding uh, in holes which we dig the ground. And uh, we, we thought that uh, we were going to leave only for three days and we are going to come back. But uh, it's been 50 years and we didn't kiss back. We didn't get tired. But do you expect to grow up and see Cyprus reunified? Yes. We want to see right, Cyprus unified. Do you think it will be? We hope. To be. One day. One day. But time has few healing properties in Cyprus. The Greeks dream of reunification, but standing in the way of any settlement are the nightmares of 1974. You come across them all over the island. The village of Tokni is a sort of miniature synopsis of the charm of Greek Cyprus. An exquisite church, blue shutters, white walls, dark green shade. But on the 14th of August, 1974, every adult Turkish Cypriot male in this village was rounded up by the Greek Cypriot irregulars, then in revolt against the government of the island. And none of those Turks have ever been seen again. I came back to the village nearly 15 years later and found that the natives were indeed very friendly, but that they didn't welcome all that many questions. I started, where else? In the coffee shop that is the hub of Cypriot village life. The Greek owner was a nice guy and prepared to be frank. Let me get straight to the point then, Mr. The, it is said the Turkish Cypriots of this village were slaughtered en masse. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened because I didn't see. But they got them together and kept them inside the school. I don't know for how long. 24 hours approximately. Two big coaches came and took them someplace. I don't know where. How do the people in the village feel now about what happened to their Turkish neighbors? When the word was out that the Turks were killed, though we didn't know what had happened to them, really, we felt sorry because we had a good life. There were some troublemakers, on our side too, of course, but the rest were good people. We worked closely together, as farmers, them herdsmen and all that. We worked closely together. We had a good life, always. Not everyone was as nice as Mr. Sotiris. Mr. Zaptius is identified by Turks and Greeks, and identifies himself as a supporter of the Greek Cypriot fascist underground, Aoka B. You were in Tokyo. I was in Tokyo, yes. And do you remember what happened with the Turkish Cypriot? Well, I uh, remember that they had a fighting and uh, that's all. I don't know, know anything about it after them, what and happens to them. And you don't know where they are now? No, I don't know where they are now. The Turkish side say there was a terrible massacre of their people here. Well, the Turkish in, uh, from Tokni, the Turkish people from Tokni, they were not human beings people. They were living in Zul. They didn't know anything about the human beings people. They were like animals? Yes, they look like an animals. The Turkish quarter has been emptied, and the Turkish cemeteries have been desecrated to make the shame of Tokni complete. The people described as animals by Mr. Zaptiers have now moved from Tokni to Tashkent, a village in the mountains of the Turkish north. I found the village to be a continuous commemoration of its lost menfolk, still stranded in time. It was obviously once a Greek church. This is, this is a museum. A museum of what? A museum of who we lost them in 1974. Here in the war. You see all these pictures. They're all here. That one is over there is my father. That's your father? Yeah. And are your uncles there too? Yeah, and the other three pictures are my father's <coughs> brothers. All the males in the village, over the age of 16, were taken away. One man only lived to tell the tale, and he still lives, chiefly in order to tell it. One of the Greeks fired a shot into the air. As soon as that shot was heard, all the others started firing on us. They fired continuously, 
There was shouting, screaming. It was impossible to escape anywhere. Everybody fell onto the floor in a heap. The head of one of my friends split, and his brain splashed on me, here. One Greek was ordering others to go around and inspect who was dead and who wasn't. They started shooting people in the head to make sure. I guess they did not shoot me because they saw the brain on my face. And they must have thought it was my brain. This village of widows, old people and adolescents still seethes with resentment against the Greeks. It is one of the countless scars left on Cyprus by recent history, and it's unlikely to heal. Most Cypriots, Greek and Turkish, have an atrocity story they can tell. Sometimes, though, it has a heartening side to it. In 1974, Yanis Kleanthu, a Greek Cypriot hostage, was about to suffer in a terrible revenge planned by the Turks for an incident like the Tokni one. He was saved by the extraordinary action of a humane Turkish Cypriot policeman. Oh my God. We owe him our lives, 240 people. I mean, we would have been 240 missing, more than the 2,000 that are missing now. Do you and nobody would have discovered us. Before the Turkish invasion, Yanis lived in Kyrenia, which is to the Greek Cypriots what Calais was to Mary Tudor. It is the jewel of their northern coast. And Yanis Kleanthu used to be the curator of its lovely castle and museum. When the town fell to the invader in 1974, its entire Greek population was expelled. Of the many captives taken, not all were returned. When a Turkish army officer, bent on reprisal, issued his chilling order to the local policeman, it looked as if Yanis was about to join the ranks of the missing persons. He says to this Turkish Cypriot policeman, ex-policeman, uh, I want three of these Greeks for every Turk that was killed. They killed 80 people, so I want 240 people. So he started counting. I was number five, I remember. And number six was an ex-Greek police officer. And when he got on number six, he stopped counting. And then he drew back and did the, saluted this ex-police officer. And I said to him, Mr. Alexis, oh, now I've said the name, what uh, happened, how do, he says to me, he was the only sergeant I could trust when I was in the police force in Paphos. So if we ever get out of here alive, this is the man that saved us, that must have saved us. It was only later that Yanis discovered what had happened. With exceptional courage, the Turkish Cypriot policeman secretly telephoned the Red Cross. He told them exactly where to come and insisted that they do so at once. But instead of being a hostage, you might have been a casualty and you were saved from that by the direct intervention of a Turkish yes, Cypriot. Certainly, yes. I wish. I knew the name of that man. I don't, I don't remember his name, and certainly he must, if he's not retired, he must still be in the police, in the Turkish police force in Nicosia or Kyrenia. Those Greeks who died, or are still missing, are also enshrined and commemorated, as here in a club run by Greek refugees from the town of Zodia. The ones who survived haven't seen their homes in 15 years. The dream of a lost ancestral home is the chief vernacular of this club and of many like it. As ever in Cyprus, 1974 is yesterday and the past is very fresh. Every month we are dreaming we are going to our houses <laughs> by dreaming. <laughs> we are expecting the time to go there. So this is the dream of the Zodiac. Yeah. <laughs> we are expecting it. With our passport, we, tra we can travel all over the world except our house that we built, my family built, except our house. Mr. Elias, tell me how I would find your house, having to leave it to me to visit it. All right. Going from the main road from Nicosia to Morfu, you are arriving here just opposite to the elementary school. Here is the elementary school, and opposite to the elementary school is my house. 
To the undisguised amusement of the BBC camera crew, I crossed the line and videoed Zodia for its former inhabitants. During my Pied Piper visit, I was able to record their former clubhouse and went on to see how traces of Greek presence had been erased or altered. The Church of the Holy Cross in Zodia had become a Sati Zeki Mosque of the village now renamed Bostanji. The Greek memorials had been desecrated, and not all of these inhabitants are Cypriot. <coughs> Turkish Cypriot newspapers and opposition politicians confirm that tens of thousands of settlers have been brought from the mainland to beef up the Turkish presence on Cyprus, leading to resentment from many Turkish Cypriots too. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this morning I went where you can't go, to your village of Zodia, and we were not allowed to film military areas, and inside the church of Kato Zodia, which has become a mosque, we weren't allowed to film. But what we've got, you will see, and I now present it to you. That's very nice of you. This was the very first glimpse these people had had of their hometown for 15 years. The Lidra Palace Hotel is now a theme park of incongruities, which would make it unrecognizable to a former guest. There are 15-year-old shrapnel graffiti, for one thing. The music is distinctly on Mediterranean, for another. And the swimming pool is effectively men only. Transferred here from the Chile... it can serve as a rendezvous point for those families who remain sundered by the consequences of 1974. I paid this garden a visit on a day when a Turkish Cypriot family was having what the island cannot. Even if only for an hour, they were having a reunion. The grandmother still lives on the Greek side. Her relatives are sequestered in the north. The UN officially calls this a humanitarian visit but it looks more like a prison visit. As the band plays on, the meeting shyly begins. The women folk have been in intermittent contact, but if they knew of it, the Canadians might want to sound a fanfare in honor of the fact that this is the first time in 15 years that the old lady has seen her son. Humanitarian visits of one sort or another occupy a huge amount of UN time and money. A UN convoy once a week crosses the frontier. It carries supplies from the Greek side and heads to the most northern village on the island. In 1974, the Greek community in the village of Rizo Karpaso on the northern panhandle was bypassed by the invading Turkish troops. When the ceasefire was called, it was agreed to let those Greeks who wished to remain there to do so. But instead, cut off in their peninsula, 
and subject to continuous Turkish pressure to leave, the Greeks have been left to grow old, to die out, or to join the refugees to the south. For the moment, the Greeks of Rizokapiso live uneasily under Turkish police control, guarding the remnants of their former national identity. Charity may be received by the truckload, but this community is a limb without any real connection to its trunk or body. The Turks of Tokni and elsewhere may have feared physical extermination, but the Greeks of northern Cyprus fear cultural annihilation too. The disappearance of their language and their culture from one of its most deeply rooted and well-cultivated lands. In such circumstances, the survivors will tend to cling especially to their religion. On this Sunday morning, the last Greek priest in Turkish-occupied Cyprus celebrates Mass. In a church that has been stripped by looters of all its decoration, icons are brought in by the elderly and devout, since it is not safe to leave them in place. The liturgy is sung with an unusual devotion, expressing national endurance as well as religious orthodoxy. The Turkish authorities do not permit Greek children to be educated beyond the primary level. Those seeking secondary education must leave. Those who leave may not return. Trying to avoid police surveillance, one of the last two Greek Cypriot teachers agreed to talk to me. Yanula is in an acute dilemma. Four of her five children have moved south for good to pursue the education that is denied them. If she follows, her pupils will have no teacher. I have four children in Nicosia, and I live here only with my husband and one of my children. And I, I feel very badly because I don't know how uh, they are there. And I fight my with self just to get the decision to stay or to go. And when I go there, I feel badly again because I don't know how is my husband and my other child here. And this year, he's going to leave the village also because he finished the elementary school. At this point, the police arrived and Yanula's talk with me was abruptly broken off. So a few days later, I went to the Lidra Palace checkpoint and waited rather anxiously to see if Yanula had been allowed to come south to meet her children. I was very relieved to see her. The Greek remnant in the north lives on the sufferance of the Turks and can only visit the south under severely restricted conditions. Though she had agreed to a second interview and understood the risk she was running, I took care not to catch her eye as she completed the various formalities that a Cypriot citizen must undergo in order to visit one half of her own country of birth. A bribe to the Turkish customs officer to avoid a tiresome baggage search in the boiling sun is the least of these indignities. Once across the frontier, she told us what had befallen her after we'd been so rudely interrupted. A policeman, but not in policeman uniform, uh, came near me and, and called me and told me, where did you go? Uh, I said, nowhere. And now where you lie, because a lot of uh, people saw you. Then asked me again, uh, what did you say to them? I said again, nothing. I didn't say anything. But he was looking at me with uh, much angry and um, was frightened me, Fright he was frightening me. And I felt much horror because he told me, you will see them. 
then at the night I was looking uh, forward to to leave from that village because I didn't know what will happen to me. At least Yanula can see her children for a few days before having to return to the dilemma she faced in the first place. When or if she and those like her give up, the Greek presence in northern Cyprus will have ended. As I traveled through Cyprus, I was often reminded that the island has been fortified since antiquity and has been a place of arms for competing civilizations since before the Roman Empire. Today it plays reluctant host to British bases and listening posts linked to the NATO and American networks in the Middle East. And the strategic situation of Cyprus, moored as it is alongside Syria, the Lebanon, Israel and Egypt, has long made it an object of desire for the great powers. The fondness of outsiders for partition and for a weak Cypriot state is felt by many Cypriots to be the root of the problem. In 1974, after Henry Kissinger had managed to show partiality both for the Greek dictators and for the Turkish invaders, the United States lost an embassy to arson and an ambassador to an assassin, while Greek Cypriots demonstrated in huge numbers at what they called Western betrayal. This golf ball installation, inelegantly dominating Mount Olympus, is ideally situated to monitor the radio waves of the Middle East. Ninety-nine square miles of the island actually belong to the United Kingdom, and the area has been lovingly converted to give as good an impression as possible of the playing fields of Eton. Back in the capital, it is only foreign troops who can permit entry to the frontier zone. Uh, one Charlie, this is uh, Fox Drive One uh, Radio Check, over. Uh, Fox Drive One uh, Roger. Here, where the division of communities is as wide as a street, it is easy to see why the Greeks refer with melancholy to the dead zone. Tense and fraught though this district already is, it may easily become more so. If Turkey finally absorbs the north, as some fear, and if the Greeks respond, this could become the border between two outside states, as well as between two Cypriot communities, in which case there would be plenty of flashpoints. They'll end up pointing weapons at each other, cocking weapons, uh, whether they're loaded or not, who knows? If you've got a soldier pointing a weapon at you, you must assume that it's loaded. Uh, it gets to the point where, in fact, uh, if you've got the opposing forces, they, they engage in trading. And uh, what's happened here, just about where the two soldiers are standing uh, down on the low ground, was uh, a Turk soldier was shot by, uh, by Greek soldiers. And uh, it happens back and forth, Greek soldiers trading with Turk soldiers. And uh, obviously, if an officer comes along or a senior NCO, uh, the game is up. and. Uh, you know, the guilty party gets hunted down where he lies, so to speak. When you say trading, do you mean smuggling or do you mean swapping? Uh, the popular theory, one held by the soldiers anyway, is that the, uh, uh, our friends to the north, the Turkish forces, they trade uh, uh, drugs for pornography, which the, uh, which the Greeks have to the south. The weeds of drugs and pornography flourish in the wasteland. Morning. Raising my hat to one of the many sentries who keep this strip under observation from either side, I and my new Canadian friends tread tactfully along. Time stopped here in a moment of furious violence, leaving ruins and wreckage as witness. Shops and cafes are deserted and shuttered, as they were on the day they were abandoned. And you can see yet another freeze-frame picture of 1974. We have an interesting spot here. If uh, 
you take a look inside, we have a small cafe with the 1960s uh, motif on the walls. Oh, yes. From what I understand, everything was set up uh, in the pre-1974 mode with glasses, cups. To like Marie them. Celeste or something. Yeah. And if uh, we carry on just up here, we have the booby-trapped uh, building, which is rather interesting as well. This whole block, is, in fact, is uh, booby-trapped. And you can actually see it through here. Uh, inside, against the wall, you can see where a wire leads from this uh, grate here to a grenade. What um, would you have to do to set it off? You have to break through this shutter. Well, the wire for the one that we can see is actually cut, so it's been essentially immobilized. But uh, as far as the rest of the block is concerned, we have no idea. So we just stay out. Give it a wide berth. Exactly. Yeah, me too. And if we come up just around the corner, you can see uh, where the buffer zone carries on it to the Turkish side of the uh, There was a time when, for soldiers of all nations, this was a street of joy. You can see up here we have the Olympus Hotel. Uh, it was the Red Light Hotel, I remember the Olympus. Yeah. From what I'm told uh, from the older UN soldiers that have been here before, that was the in place to come in its heyday. Famed for the generosity and intelligence of its women folk. It looks rather joyless as we speak. There are, of course, no cars on these dead streets, so I was surprised to be offered a tour of a showroom. Not much of a showroom. No, no. You can tell by the stench the uh, septic tank takes for uh, unpleasant tours. Right off, you can see what they keep down here. Since 1974, you've got uh, some 50 odd cars which were left brand new, but haven't been touched since. Because of the way the buffer zone runs, the uh, Turkish forces won't allow the owner of these cars to take them out through the uh, buffer zone. So they've stuck here until uh, they can find some sort of a, uh, you know, equitable agreement. But you've got 50 odd brand new cars. We have 15 years. Yes, exactly. Ralph Denktash the Turkish Cypriot leader, accepts an embrace at a military parade held to celebrate the anniversary of the invasion. Just a few streets away, the parade can be seen in its aerodynamic aspects by the Greeks, and its triumphant music is clearly audible to them. To the Greeks, everything about the Turkish parade is an insult and a provocation. <laughs> Commemorating the invasion in a different way, a fierce cohort of Greek Cypriot women managed to break through into the dead zone and occupy it for several days. Turks, this was the moral equivalent of an assault and was taken very seriously. We're in a very dangerous situation. I suggest that you leave. The Turkish security forces have arrived and there is no way that I can guarantee your safety.
When the Greeks look north, they tend to see not a minority, but the army of a much larger neighbor. When the Turks see unarmed women, they see the advance guard of a possible Greek revenge for the humiliation of 1974. Every image on the island returns us to that fateful year. These white painted rocks on the mountain slope behind me were painted by the Turks, but it was all for the benefit of the Greek Cypriots. They were painted white, not for decoration, but for propaganda. At a distance of many miles, from all the way across the frontier, they can be seen as the outline of an immense Turkish flag and an accompanying slogan. And what they taunt the Greeks with is the thought that Northern Cyprus might be Turkish forever and that no Greek feet would ever tread these mountains again. I began this journey at an empty modern airport, stranded in time since 1974, and I ended up at an even more grotesque location, at an empty modern city, abandoned by its 50,000 inhabitants, who fled it at gunpoint in the same year. It stands on the eastern extremity of Cyprus, a ghost town. No journalists are permitted by the Turks to visit Varosha, the new suburb of historic Famagusta. Having tried to get a sense of it from the air, I tried an approach by sea, only to be repelled by Austrian soldiers of the United Nations. You crossed the maritime security line. What's the problem? This is a UN control area. And? And? What and? So what? What have we done? What's the problem? Tell me. This is a UN control area. Go back or we call the police. Finally, I crossed again to the north, walked as close to the fence as I could, and then climbed to the top of an hotel, like this blitzed one to look over the wire into the forbidden city. For 15 years, Varosha has stood reproachfully void of human presence, vacant testimony to the waste and inhumanity of partition, that barren and artificial symbol of political failure.